Hello, my name is Chris and I am the creator of Vantage. Today I'm going to show you a technical video on how the world for Vantage is created. In a nutshell, it's a little bit of algorithm, a little bit of static terrain, and a little bit of procedural generation. Just to clarify, moving forward, the editor windows you're about to see are for my own personal use, which is why they don't look very user-friendly. In the future, I may expose these so other people can make their own worlds in Vantage, but that will be at a later time. The game is now also available on Steam if you wish to check out more information. So the first thing we need to do is to set things up so we can start colliding some tectonic plates. So let's just get right into it. The first thing we need to do is set the size of the world. In the upper left we have the parameters to do that. The generate LODs is a number of LODs that will be displayed for the terrain when you're walking around the world and see it visually. Page size is how the terrain is stored in file. So the page size of 10 will be 10 by 10, which means 100 points per page of terrain. Pages per file will be how many pages will be in each file to help break up the files. The database page per file is for database organization for the items that will be generated in the world. And of course, world size, which will be generating how many pages will be in the world. So multiply that by the page size, and that's how many points will be on the world. For this example, we are just going to do a 128 page world. Now we need to generate our fault lines for making the tectonic plates. I won't go through every variable here, but what these values are going to do is make many random curved lines across the world. Think of it as drawing many squiggly lines across a piece of paper from one inch to the other, and then you will be cutting that piece of paper off of all those lines and making it like a jigsaw puzzle. The Continents tab works in a very similar fashion. It's another layer of random line drawing in a sense. And this defines general land masses for the collisions we're about to make. So now it is time to simulate a world. As I click the button you see that a new randomly generated world map is being created. Each time new lines are being calculated to create the tectonic plates and the land masses. I will keep clicking until I find a general decent looking world. Now in the lower right we have our plate tectonic viewer. Here we can see all the specific plates and the location it is on the world. We can also show the plate and the location in the world and scroll through them and see where they all are. Now it's finally time to generate the frames. You can see at the bottom there's a small box that says frame generation. Each time we generate one frame, that's going to simulate approximately 100,000 years of plate tectonic movement for our world. And we will now start generating the frames. Watch the image as I generate frames. The Big Bang position shown above the image shows the movement of the tectonic plates. In addition to that, they will be randomly rotating and colliding into each other each frame. Notice how the land masses are moving and rotating, colliding, and even splitting apart. When I activate the Show Terrain Collisions checkbox, you'll see exactly what I mean. The dots you see are going from light to dark. The lighter collisions are the more recent collisions, the darker ones are the older collisions. This is recording all the timestamps of all the collisions so we can use this on our world generation window next. And we are now done with this window. We're going to save this information and move on to the next window. So now we actually generate the world with the information that we have. We convert all that collision data that we just got into nodes. Each node represents a piece of static height field data, whether it be a mountain, 
a plains, or an island. The first thing we have to do is load in the file. As you see, as we load in the file, it's generating some nodes randomly. And for simplicity's sake, it's only loading in one out of every 10 points. Otherwise, we would have a lot of nodes to deal with. So now we have a list of static terrain files. These files are static height maps of USGS data of real locations in the world. We will be manipulating them heavily, however, to generate the world. There are mountains, islands, and plains. What determines whether the node is a mountain, island, or plain depends on how the plate tectonic collisions collided. So now let's look at some of the nodes on the map. I select a group of mountain nodes and they appear on the map. When I select on one, I can see the information on the right side. It shows me the location of where it is and how many erosion passes that are going to occur with that. The erosion passes is a number of times the erosion algorithm will be applied to that node. The earlier that a plate tectonic collision occurred, the more erosion passes will be done to that node. That means for an example for a mountain, a newly formed mountain with no erosion passes will be very tall and very spiky. However, a mountain with 20 erosion passes on it will still be large, but not as jagged. So now we get to the heart of the terraforming algorithm. So each point on the world has a temperature and rainfall value. The temperature value is based off of many factors, including latitude, longitude, subtropical zones, and location from the equator. Terrain altitude is used for the procedural generation of items. The latitude, power drop-off, and subtropical zones are all for algorithms that will help generate the temperature for the subtropical zones and the equator and the arctic zones. The wind properties are what determine the final rainfall value. This uses an algorithm based on the world wind patterns of the Earth. For each point on the world, there's a simulated wind pattern path from past to present to future. Cloud ceiling and cloud thickness determine whether that path collides with a mountain and whether it, the moisture will be affected by that. Wind speed, of course, determines at which points along the world it, is, it will record the simulation. And of course, the back and front wind count is the before and after of the simulation. Let's use an example. Let's say the center point right there where I have the white dot in the center of the map is actually a node and we want to find the, the rainfall value for it. And let's say the wind is just going from left to right straight. Um, so what happens is there's a back wind count of 30. So what it does is it goes back 30 times 10 for 300 points back and every 10 points towards it, it will calculate something. When it's over water, when each point is over water, it will gain a rainfall value. And it will become wetter, it will become a higher and higher rainfall value. When those points start to go over land, they slowly start to lose their rainfall value as, it is, as a cloud is losing the moisture and basically raining on the land. So, and then when it gets to the point, there's now a rainfall value. Now there's a front wind count as well. Now that determines what it is because of the mountains in front of it. So if the cloud ceiling and thickness is hitting a mountain in front of it, what it's doing is it's actually stopping the clouds from actually moving forward. So what happens is the rainfall value actually increases at the final point because it, it is not running, it is not simply passing over it, it is actually stopping and raining more and there's more moisture on that area. So what happens is this creates windward and leeward sides of mountains. So one side of a mountain can be wet and then the other side will be completely dry. And that is how the algorithm basically works. Here are some examples of in-game footage of leeward and windward side of mountains. You can see there are little patches of um, wet or fertile on one side of a mountain and dry on another. There are pockets of their dryness in between mountains while there's wet near the open areas. And this one here is specifically, 
you know, a lot of wet on one side and then I'm sitting on, I'm standing on a mountain and you can see it's very dry and very desert-like on the other side. So for procedural generation, the last part of this video, I'm just going to talk through watching um, video footage. Um, as you can see right now, there's nothing here because it's currently generating new items for the world. As we walk around, it will slowly start populating the world once it's done completing its um, algorithms. So it'll put in the items page by page, terrain page by terrain page, database page by database page, and it will slowly populate the world uh, based around an area around the player. If there's multiple players, it will it will divide the work between the two. So as you can see, things slowly pop in as I'm walking around. As I walk into a new area, it instantly goes, it needs to generate items there, and so it does. Off in this distance there, you can see things are already generated. That must have been where I've previously been in the world before. So those were already done and ready to be loaded in, and they were immediately loaded in. So this is all a one-time generation. Once these items are here, they are here, which you will see in the next load when we start loading. Items will just instantly appear. So items are basically based off of where they need to be placed and there are constraints for that. There are height constraints, altitude constraints, rainfall constraints, and temperature constraints. And so there is a sweet spot for the optimal place for that to be among those three. And then you can add a fall off percentage value based off of the deviation of those three. So what happens is there will be concentrated parts of where you want a specific object to spawn. And then it will slowly dissipate based off of the temperature. The less hospitable it is for its optimal temperature and rainfall and altitude, then the less it will be appear in that area. And you can also do this in multiple biomes if you wish as well. And so as here, as you saw, you load in, it spawned in immediately and you could see everything almost immediately and everything was already loaded in the game. You can, of course, preload all of this when you generate a world, but that would be a lot, of, a lot of data and a lot of needless data that very few people would probably ever interact with. And so that's the way the procedural generation works. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it very informative. Again, the game is on Steam if you want to check it out or see more screenshots, video, or information. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. And thanks for watching.